In Jesus' name. Father Lord, we thank you for whom you are. Ancient of days, we exalt and honor you once again. Lord, we are committed to your presence as we celebrate the birth of your son Jesus Christ. Lord, 2,000 years ago, in the small town of Bethlehem, you made your love for humanity known. You make your peace known with man. You send your son, Christ Jesus, to take my place, even when I was not qualified to be the least in the kingdom of heaven. A chief sinner, you allowed me to become your servant. Lord, through the death of your son, our iniquity was forgiven. Our guilt were pardoned. You gave us hope. In the midst of hopelessness. Lord, that's why today we are using this opportunity to thank you, to bless your name, because there is no manner of love that is greater than this. That a friend who loved his friend to the extent he gave his life for his friend. You died so that we will not have to die for our foolishness. You died so that we can be saved. And today, that's why we celebrate. We do not celebrate because the date is accurate. We do not celebrate because the woman named it Christmas. But we celebrate because unto us a son is given. Unto us a son is born. And his name is wonderful. Counselor. Prince of Peace and a mighty God. Lord, as we wish all our team a Merry Christmas and a wonderful celebration of the birth of Christ, whose birth has given us a hope and has made plan for our future that we will not perish, that our fall in the garden was not our end, that we have a better future ahead of us. And the Lord blessing which he made to Abraham our father can be inherited through Christ in us and that's why today because Christ in us is the hope of glory I celebrate with thousands and millions of the saints out there who have risen to celebrate the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ to give glory to the king the newborn Jesus and to to exalt the name of God in the highest. The Son, which is well beloved, in whom God is well pleased, we give glory to you, O Lord. For giving us your Son on our account. You sent him to die. He gave up his life so that we can live again. So, what a friend we have in Jesus. He is everything to us. Lord Jesus, I thank you for such a day. As these, as we look into your world, let your Holy Spirit give us insights. Let your wisdom be multiplied upon us. Let as many who have no reason to celebrate, celebrate. Let as many that are done cast be lifted up. Because this is the reason why you came. Because the Spirit of the Lord was upon you. And you were anointed to proclaim good tidings to the people, to proclaim liberty to the captive, and to preach the covenant of sight to the blind, and to preach freedom to those who are in bondage. Lord, today I stand on that same message to preach the covenant of sight to the blind, to proclaim liberty to the captive. Lord, let your freedom be upon the church. Because upon this rock, you will build your church. The gate of hell will not prevail against us. The gate of power will not prevail against your church. Lord, you share your love for us. There is no love that is greater than this. That a man will love his friend and give his life for his friend. Lord Jesus, your love has been made eminent to us. That's why the universe celebrates today. 
Whether they celebrate in ignorance, some celebrate in understanding, some celebrate in ignorance, but in all, we give glory to the Lord. To whom the whole family of the earth will see the original name. To God, the only wise king, be glory, dominion, strength, might forever. Holy Spirit, teach us your word. Make known to us thy presence. Teach us thy greatness. Teach us to stand firm in the liberty where you have made us free. As we expose the book of Revelation, guide us with wisdom that is needed for this teaching. And understanding to make known to the people the hidden treasure in the word of God. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Brethren, today you are welcome once again. This is my opportunity to thank you and to tell you our presence here for as many of our team that have been with us from the beginning of this program till now. We said happy the birth of Christ Jesus. As we celebrate his birth, we have good reason to also expect his return. Because the Christ that was born 2,000 years ago was crucified that same 2,000 years ago. Now we knew he has risen that same 2,000 years ago and he's coming back very soon. And that is the purpose for this teaching. And that's why we are going to take our time to explain a message to you. Our topic today is letter to the church of Theatre. Letter to the church of Theatre. And why we dwell in the letter to the church of Theatre? Before we start, I want to use this opportunity to tell you something. I will be your host. My name is Special Ari Collins Abogre, a member of Christian Global Foundation. And I will be your speaker today. And I'm also the head of Open Heart Fellowship. You can reach us on our website, which is cgfnslogin.app. Cgfnslogin.app. You can view our teachings. If you have missed any part of this teaching, either on understanding prophecy or teaching on Open Heart Fellowship. Every Tuesday, you can see it in the website, or you can follow us on Facebook by just simply type CGF Open House. It will take you right to our page. You can set us out, and God bless you as you listen. Brethren, today we have a very great topic, and this topic is something I love to learn from myself. And I want all of you to also pay attention as you learn from the same teaching. Today, our teaching is Letters to the Church of Theatre. Theatre is a church in Asia Manor, which today we call Turkey. So, this letter of Christ to this particular church is something to be desired. Because this church of Theatre is a church that most of you have heard about in Revelation. They have some few commendations, but not so many. And they also have some rebuke by Christ Jesus. Our text today is taken from the book of Revelation, chapter 2, from verse 18 to 29. I read, write this to Theatre. The angels of the church, the angels of the church of Theatre, right? This word says the Son of God. Eyes, pouring breeze, fire breeze, standing in the, on his feet, on the midst of a famous fire branch, says this. I see everything you are doing. For me, and I'm impressed. God, we might be Christian living on top of the surface of the earth, thinking that 
we do whatever we feel is right. But somebody is watching us. And that is what Christ is making us understand here. That no matter whatever we think we do on earth, whether good or evil, He sees it. He knows our work. Don't be foolish by anybody deceiving you that whatever you do is in secret. There is nothing you don't under the sun that is hidden. There is nothing you do. Some people can even come in more than just to cover up some secrets. But I tell you, even committing murder will not cover up secrets. Because there is no point committing murder when you know that your secrets are not hidden in the first place. Every work we do, whether good or evil, is seen by all. And it's hidden from our eyes. Behind the world might be so black that you cannot see. But there is always an eye that sees everything you do under the sun, whether good or evil. Whether thoughts are in the mind, even before you lost it, somebody sees you. He knows what you are thinking. Even when you decide to give that one million to charity so that you can be promoted, you might think you fool everybody in the congregation, but somebody at there saw you. He knows what is in your heart, even before you think about it. And that is what he's telling you here. I know your work. I know all your impression. Your work might be good and impressive. If it's also bad, it's going to tell you it is bad. But he's telling you here that he sees your work. That your work was impressive. The love you showed in the church. The faith you hold on to God irrespective of situation you find yourself. The service you render to others. Your persistency in the things of God. Not giving up because the road sinks up or down. Yes, they are very impressive. You get better at it every day. God knows. He knows. Even when nobody tells you thank you. Even when nobody sees your works. Even when you are blocked on every platform, God knows your work. And they are not hidden from his eyes. They may be hidden from the eyes of men, but not from the eyes of the Lord. The eyes sees all things. No wonder the psalmist says, where will I go to be hidden from your presence? Even if I say, let the grave cover me, your eyes will be there to guide. The eyes of the Lord ranges to all. So don't fool yourself, O oh man. Nothing is hidden under the sun. You might call your secret top secret, top, top secret. Your top secret will one day become a reality. It's not going to be hidden forever. There is nothing hidden. God knows every secret. And He says to you, I seize everything you are doing. That is God talking to you. Do you think you are alone? No, you are not. I know some scientists have traveled to Mars, traveled around the universe to check. Are we alone in the universe? They are asking that question. Why well, their answer does not need space or mass to find out. God already told you. You are not alone. <coughs> he sees you. You might be thinking, nobody sees you, but he sees everything you do on day to day activity. There is a record for every man, and there is a cross for every man under the earth. There is a cross for you, and there is a record book that is being kept of all your good work, all your evil work. How many cup of water you gave to an injured victim? And how many bottles of wine you gave to a drunkard to make him drunk so that you can take away his possession? He sees you. He knows what is in your heart. And he knows all your thoughts. He is a God. Not a God that is far away. Ask yourself one question. 
Science has been doing research for the past 2,000 years. <coughs> no one has been able to make one single tissue in human body. Even when they try, they can only use Tilly Deep Printer to print what is already in man. By grinding human organ, putting it in a Tilly Deep Printer to print the same thing. Is that the people you want to rely upon? And you have to take their word above the one that created the brain? I tell you, if you believe that the brain of human beings is so complex and well understood, don't you think somebody that makes human brain has understanding? Or somebody that creates human eye can see? Or somebody that creates the hand can handle? Or somebody that creates the leg or the feet can walk? Do not be mock. He sees you. He knows what is in your heart. He knows your thoughts. The church of Theatera were busy about their daily service. They never knew somebody knows what they were doing. All they know is that every day they go try to do their best, just as we do every day in the world. They want to be good Christians. They want to follow peace with all men. They want to love their neighbor as they love themselves. God was busy writing it down. But they never knew he was writing it. And at the end of the world, a lot of us will be surprised. How many records somebody has lost? Just like we live in a society today where everything is being spied upon. People are busy. Why are you busy? Celebrating on social media, somebody is busy keeping it, keeping it as a record file for himself. You may be surprised at the last how many records even your fellow men have on you that you don't even know. Not to talk of God. God has a record of every of our activity. And now we know that God has a record. Are we not supposed to be careful how we live our life? The theaters understood not that God was watching them. But yet, they followed God in everything. To the extent they were impressive. Christ looked at their work and find them impressive. They were in, he was impressed by their conduct. He was impressed by their behavior. Even their love for him. Because how do we prove we love God? By loving our brethren also. Christ found this love impressive. Not only were they loving by saying opening empty vows, how I love Jesus every Sunday, but they follows it with works. Their works was paramount. And they held on to faith. Theatre was not very rich, but their faith speak on their behalf. And the service they held to God, they were not wavering in their service. They did not say, oh, it is time, it's not time to build the house of the Lord, the trouble is too much. Now it's time to go to our own house. No. They realized, even though there is trouble, it is still time for the house of the Lord. It is still time to do God's service. They kept on in their persistency. They hold on, even when all who were born were gone. They understand that long suffering was part of the gift of the Holy Spirit. But today, how many Christians still believe in long suffering? Today, long suffering is not something that the church has forgotten. <coughs> something that should not even be preached in the church. Because they forgot that long suffering is one of the fruits which Christians must possess in order to enter heaven. As we continue to look, Jesus sent his message to the church of Theatera. Theatera was a wealthy town of Lycos, rivers in the Rome province of Asia. Modern day stock. The angels of the church of Theatera. The message from the Lord Jesus Christ through an angel or a messenger to the angels of the church of Theatera writes in Revelation 2.18 saying, this was not John message to the theater believers. It was a message from the Lord. The description of the end of verse 18 verified the authors of this message is Jesus Christ himself. The word of the Son of God whose eyes are like brazen fire. Whose feet is like a brownish brass. 
This description removes any doubts of the identity of the one who gave this message. What is brass? Brass symbolizes judgment. The one that is ready to come and judge. This are felt to you that is message to the church and the warnings are not made for salvation. They are made for the oncoming judgment. And he is telling the church that that's what he came to die for you. And he was willing to give you grace in the midst of a place where grace ought not to exist. He gave you an extraordinary grace. That a time will come that that grace will no longer be available. That his judgment will set in. That do not think because of his quietness, despite the sins and the evil that are launching on earth, that he does not see. He sees. That's why his name is the Lord that sees. The Lord that sees me. He is the Lord. He sees all. Even though he has seen all their action and their deed, but yet it is not time to visit judgment. Because just like as he did with the children of Israel, when they were about to enter the land of Canaan, he told Moses to wait 40 years in the wilderness. Do you know why? Because the immorality of the Amorites was not yet full. But God was waiting for their cup to be full before he can permit judgment. Because God that we know will not punish the wicked with the righteous. Even when Sodom has done committed water in the eyes of the Lord, and they were now in destruction, God told Abraham that he could not destroy Sodom if he can find 40 righteous men in Sodom. And that is God. At the end, not even 10 righteous men was found in Sodom. But what happened if God find one? God is going to take away that one and he's going to destroy Sodom. And that was what happened to Lot. I remember what the angel said to Lot. You must flee to the mountain because we cannot do anything until thou art gone. Because he was a righteous man. God cannot destroy the righteous and the wicked. Because God cannot do anything until the last righteous man is out of the earth. So that is why you may see evil trials happening upon the earth right now. Some evil claim the end has come. But the end cannot come as long as the saints still reside on the earth. If not, the Holy Spirit cannot be taken out. And the Holy Spirit will be taken out for the wicked man to be revealed. And the man of sin, whose coming is after the work of Satan, with all lying, wonder, and deceivable deceivable laws of them that perish. This is what we are waiting for. And Christ's message to the theatrical believers was credition of the ends of the things shows us that the author was Christ himself. He was the son of God whose eyes was brazen like fire which belies trials and judgments and burnishing brows. This characteristic removed any doubt of the identity of the one who was given the message and identified himself. Jesus affirmed the church positive action. I know your deed. Christ is not an ungrateful person. He is not a person that will forget your labor of love, which you have shown towards his name. No. That's why the Bible tells you that God is not unfaithful to forget our labor of love, which we have shown towards his name. <coughs> he understands it. That's why Theatera has their thoughts. But Christ commended their efforts, their justice, their equity. He knows their works, he knows their action. He starts by commending them. That commendation was the first part of the speech of Christ. He did not start with their sin, but he starts by commendation. How far they have gone in the doctrine of truth. 
I know your deed, your love, your faith, your service, your perseverance. And that I know that you are now going more than you were at the first place when you started. That is what every father expects from their children. To grow beyond the place where they started. And Christ was happy about this. But these five qualities are listed. And what are the five qualities the church we are having? Love. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy might, and with all thy strength. That is the first law to believe And the second one was it, like it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And which did they were having this love for their neighbor. The second one, remember what Christ says in the book of Matthew. He says, on the last day, I will separate his sheep from the goats. And he will say to those on his right hand, When I was hungry, you gave me to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. When I was in prison, you came to visit me. That was the law of Christ was preaching here. The theatrical believers understood this teaching. They did not simply miss love is a preaching in the church. But the new love was a practice. That they visit the hungry with bread. And that they care for the widows and the orphan. That the eyes of the beggars in their streets was not allowed to fall. They understood that this was the direct message of Christ. The second part was faith. Faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Anybody that comes to God must first believe. That God is the God who he says he is. And he is able to reward anyone that diligently seek it. And they understood this in Teatera. The third was service. Rendering service to God was paramount and antecedent to the service of God. Having service to God was something every believer who must assess heaven, must believe that this work is not reserved for ministers and evangelists. The Bible says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. They knew that this was the work. They don't need to be hired to do this. They don't need to be paid to do this. But they keep it as their royal task. Just like we say, evangelism is our supreme task. This was the supreme task of the church of Teatro. The thoughts was patience and endurance. Because they understood also. They have need of patience after they have done the work. So that they can inherit the blessing. Are you ready to inherit the blessing? So you need patience. You have to have patience. If you have done a successful work with God. So that you can inherit blessing. But today. How many Christians. Are ready. To have all this virtue we just talked about. Today, people are no longer patient. They pray for a car for two months. And by the time God does not provide the car, I'm not sure your God is powerful enough. Let me go and look for a minister that can perform the magic. Well, I wish you good luck. Because nobody can perform the magic. What, who can save you if God does not save you? Who can bless you if God does not bless you? <clears throat> and said the man has his own heaven or his own blessing that he's going to give you. He cannot give you what God does not give. The last greater works. Remember what Jesus said. All these things you see me do, <coughs> greater work than this shall you do also. Do you know why? Because I go to my father. 
Because in my father's house, in my father's house, there are many mansions. If you were not so, I would have told you. And I'm going to prepare a place for you. Then I will go and I set you back to myself. So that where I am, there will my servants be also. God has prepared a place for us. And he told you that all these things you see him do, greater work than this, you will do also. But this was exactly what Teatira did. They were not only having works, they were having greater works. But in the midst of all this beautiful commendation, something happened in verse 20. Let us read. Verse 20 is not very sweet like verse 18 and 19. Why? Next, Jesus notes their sin. With all this beautiful commendation, impressive history and record, one would think sin never exists in such a church. But yet yeah, it was. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerated that woman. Which woman? Jezebel, who called herself a prophetess. By her teaching, she misled my servant into sexual immorality. And they eat food that we sacrifice to idol. Why is this place very important? Remember, in the early church, when the Apostle Creed gathered the elders in Jerusalem, the conduct of the commandment given to the saints from the Gentile nation was not ten commandments. It was only just to do this three or four, what we call four commandments, which is one, they should abstain from sexual immorality. And the second one, was they should have stayed from meat strangled, things with blood, and avoid things sacrificed to idol. These were only four laws given to the Gentile. And but this Jezebel was able to seduce them to break those laws by creating a different garment system in the church. Pastor. What I wear does not matter as long as my heart is clean. I appreciate your heart is very clean. And I wish you were actually clean. Remember what Christ tell you. He didn't tell you clean the inside of the cup and leave the outside dirty. He said clean the inside that the outside may reflect the cleanliness in the inside. If the inside is clean, the outside will reflect it. So if a Christian mind is purified, it should show forth in his conduct, in his dressing, in his attitude towards the liver. Your attitude will reflect your conduct and your character. Though I'm not one of those ministers that will address a, sex, a dress code to Christians, but learn to understand that your dressing should be fit a Christian woman if you call yourself a Christian, except you are not one. You should dress. If you are a lawyer, you will not dress like a daughter. And if you are a daughter, you will not dress like a lawyer. So if you are a Christian, you should dress like one. You should act like one. You should behave like one. You should conduct yourself like one. Orange cannot be a good. Cleanliness cannot breed on cleanliness. Good and evil does not flow from the same source. Nor dirty water and clean water from the same path. You should understand that if you want to be who you claim to be, you should act like one. Christians should not allow sin just because it makes us show love. It means we love everything. 
So if somebody shows you up in our congregation and is doing nonsense, we should not correct him because that would be against God. It would mean we, are not, we don't love the better. That's not true. Remember what the Bible says. Those who are outside the church, God will judge. But those who are within the church, we ought to judge ourselves. If not, we will be judged. Then, how can you call your brother a brother when you see your brother is putting a pin of needle into his eyes and you do not prevent it? Will he still call you a brother? Better, let us be wise. Correct that which is evil. That does not mean you should separate people from the churches or you should not tolerate new converts to dress the way they want or be encouraged in the house of the Lord. No. It actually means there is moderation. You as a believer don't need to be taught dress code on your son. But you should know of clear mind what is right in the sight of God. How we need to dress in order to please God. Remember what the Bible says. It says, if eating bread will make my brother to fall, I rather not eat. If my hair is the toast of the time, by leaving it, it's going to lead one brother in the church to sing, I will rather cover my hair. If my body is so beautiful that it can make the next man near to me in the church to commit sin. I would rather not because of myself or because of those men dress myself properly so that I will not cause them to fall. If wearing some diamond ring and some golden clothes is going to make some poor people in the church to feel weak and forgotten, I would rather dress moderate so that all of us can boldly receive from God, not from men. So, brethren, let wisdom be applied in your Christian life. The church of Thyatira did not have so many sins, but they only allowed worldliness because they live in a rich city, among a rich culture, a cultural center population where money was domain. They have to brace up to the modern life. We cannot just start those old kind of religious system like we found in Pagamos and in the rest part of Savage. No, we have to be different. We have to make our garments sparkling. We have to make ourselves beautiful. We have to mix up God with some little, little addition from the world. We have to make our garment more flashy. We have to mix our women more beautiful. We can still serve God and have some dedication to some idol temple. We can still dance to idol. After all, that will help us to avoid persecution. These things, yes, all things, I am allowed to do all things, but not all things are good for me. Food is for the stomach. Stomach is for food. But always notice one thing. That God is going to destroy both the stomach and the food. And you must understand that honey is sweet. If it's too much, it upsets your stomach. God understood the heart of man. He knows what is in the heart of the king. No thoughts are hidden from his eyes. No wonder Christ started with a good commendation, impressive record. They show love to the essence, they miss it. They did not know that love has to come with moderation. What does love do? True love corrects. True love instructs. True love impacts. Love does not neglect its own. Love does not tolerate evil. Love does not rejoice in sin. It rejoices in the right. No wonder the Bible told us in the book of First Corinthians chapter 13, that love does not rejoice in the wrong. Love does not rejoice in evil. Love, rejo love rejoices in the right thing. But these people allow this woman Jezebel, which today is the paramount goddess of this world, 
seducing the young men and women to immorality and to eating sacrifice to idols. And apparently, a false prophetess who was leading believers into compromise. The church was engaging in sexual immorality, dabbling in idolatry. Because when here, when we talk about idolatry, many of us misunderstood. Today, we no longer have fancy idol built in one kind of corner in our house or shrine as in some, in some villages in Africa. But that does not mean idolatry still do not exist in the church. Idolatry exists. And that idolatry we're talking about in today's church is apparent. This idolatry is a form of earthly things. So people cannot just leave their house and set all the kits of makeup are complete. And set that gold plate on the hand and the leg and the shoes and the back and the car are to match. But I tell you the truth. If your clothes is more important than God, that clothes has become an idol. If your academic pursuit has become more important than God, that academic pursuit has become an idol. If any business or finance or goal or anything you want to achieve in life take the place of God's love in your life, that has become an idol. So when we talk about idolatry, we are not just talking about setting up a retinue shrine in one location. So, idolatry, this woman was centered on seductive character. <clears throat> Earthly and material worship. It was her name. And what was this character Jezebel like? Jezebel was a woman in the book of King. Though here she was used symbolically, not the Jezebel who was her half wife, but we know who the original Jezebel was. What was his character? Jezebel was the wife of Ahab, the king of Israel. And Jezebel forced Israel to worship Baal. And she numbers prophets, almost about 450. So it was a substantial worship of idol. She was a mystery of pence, diamonds, gold, and pearl, and all fashion and design. That was her nature. So you see, metaphorically referenced, to the Jezebel of the Old Testament. Another adulterous woman who opposed God always, rather than rebuke the first teacher and send her out of the church. You know, today when we measure Jezebel, many people always say, oh, we are talking about the women, not always the women I know. Jezebel exists, they have men as their tools. The women they seduce to immorality. The men they seduce to riches and worldly influence. And that is what the Bible calls idolatry. And this woman was in the church. The church permitted her because we love God. We don't want to offend anybody. She is a beautiful sister. She is dedicated to our cause. Yes, she has set a Christ. But on the other way, you want to take everyone in the church away from Christ. And send them to her where she belonged. They tolerated her in the church. They did not send her out of the church. The believers in theaters were allowing her to continue her deception. Telling them what you wear does not matter as long as your heart is clean. The doctrine of Belial. Jesus pronounced judgment on this Jezebel and called the church of Theatira to repent of their sin. 
of allowing this woman in the midst of the church. I will cast her into a bed of suffering. That is what Christ is telling her. The punishment is not only for those who fall for her, but the punishment is also for Jezebel herself, who is responsible for the fall of the saints. Because the Bible says, if anyone will cause any of this little one to fall, it is better than his toe be hung on his neck and he be drawn into sea. So, this Jezebel has caused the saint to fall. Her sin will not go unnoticed before God. And because she has caused the saint to fall, and you who are in the church, acting under the influence of Jezebel, Having the same quality and character of Jezebel, causing the saints, even ministers, to fall on your accounts. And I say to you, God will cast you into a bed. And all the pastors and ministers and teachers and elders and Christians who committed fornication with you, God will throw them into great tribulation. And it says, they that commit adultery suffer intensely. In great tribulation, unless they repent of their way, I will kill all her children with death. That is what God is saying. So, you wonder why there are death in the daughters of Jezebel? Because God has promised it, He's going to kill her children with death. Then Jesus encouraged those who has remained faithful. Now I say unto the rest of you in Tiatira, and to you who do not hold the teaching of Jezebel, who have not learned Satan's so called deep secrets, the secret things, and I will not impose any other burden on you, but just hold on until you I come in Revelation 24 to 25, 2 verse 24 to 25. The faithful believer did not fail into Satan's trap. They needed to remain faithful until Christ's return. And his return is imminent. He promised us 2,000 years ago. He told us he has gone. In his father's house, there are many marshals. He has gone to prepare a place for us. And that's why every year we celebrate. We wait patiently for him. We know he will surely return. When he returns, after he has finished preparing this place, he will accept us to himself, so that where he is, there will us, his servant, be also. Are you a servant of the Lord? Do you want to be where God is? The Bible said he is seated in heaven at the right hand of the Father, waiting for the day the enemy will be put under his footstool. Do you want to be among his enemy that will be put under his footstool? Or you want to be seated where your Lord is seated. Then you have to wait and remain faithful until Christ return. There is nothing in the world that worth us escaping faithfulness for. Or that merit us giving our life to protect. What have you on earth to gain from the world? Is there anything in this world that you are going to gain? If you tolerate Jezebel and you allow her into your life, remember what he says in verse 24 to 25. He said, The rest of you in Tiatira have no hope. I have who have nothing to do with this outrageous form of worship. All things is allowed. As long as they are not against us, they must be for us. Anything goes, church. God is saying to you, who scorn this playing around the devil that get paraded as profundity? We are be as salt and we make life. I will not make your life any harder for you than it is already is. Hold on to the truths that you have received until I come down. 
But for the reward, here is the reward I have for every conqueror who overcome this so-called Jezebel. And but why in verse 20 to 23 there was a different message? Why do not why do you let this Jezebel who is called herself a prophetess to mislead my servant into cross denying? self indulging religions and I gave her a chance to change her way but she has no intention to give up the career in the God business and I am about to lay her low into a bed and along with her partners and if they play their sex and religious game the bastard of strings of their idol whoring and we also kill. And they, then every church will know that the appearance don't impress me. And I will extract every motive and make sure you get what you what you deserve. God is going to extract all our motive. And anyone that deserves wrong will get what he deserves. Here is the reward for anybody that conquer. But today, are you ready to conquer? What reward have you if you conquer? If you conquer, God has a promise for the overcomer. And this promise can be found in chapter 2, Revelation chapter 2, verse 26 to 28. God has a promise. For everybody that do right thing on earth, there is a promise. Today, the promise may not be very eminent, but there is a promise for you. Jesus said, listening to his promise to the believer in Tiatira. To whom? Who overcome and does any, and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nation. Authority not over cities but over nations. If you overcome and will give you authority over nation, you will rule them with an iron scepter. You have power, absolute right over the nation to rule them with a rod of iron, and you will have power to dash this nation to pieces as the potter dashes his vast into pieces. Just as I have received authority from my father, I will also give him the money star. The money star. Who is the money star? Lucifer. God said he will hand it to you as your price. You will do whatever you like with him. And this blessing would I include authority over nations. Victory over your enemies. And who is the head of my enemies? Lucifer, the devil, the serpent. I will put a unity between you and the serpent. Between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise that he and you shall bruise his head. And so is death. God will give you authority over death because death is an enemy and is the last enemy to be defeated. And I also give you the money stars. This money stars is Jesus. Now, in Revelation 22, verse 16, we view Jesus will give himself to the church and he will fellowship together with them forever and ever. What is Tiatera called today? Tiatera also called Tiatera also called Tiatera in ancient Greek was the name of the ancient city of Asia Minor, modern day Turkey city of Akisa in the White Castle. What is the meaning of Tiatera in the Bible? A perfume, sacrifice of labor, and the name. Fit Christ's description. 
of the book of Revelation. But what role does this woman need to pray in this whole authority in theater? Leader has a former authority over her household. A member of her home was a member of the church. She has presumably shared the good news about Jesus with her household and subsequently prepared them for Christian baptism. That was the kind of devotion that was found in theater. She's not only a Christian, but she was able to win her husband, her children, into Christian fold, which is one of the hardest things to do. And this woman being a devoted follower of Christ was able to save her husband because she follows the integrity of the church. She was one of the saints in Tiatira. So Tiatira, we are not only having followers of Jezebel who were women, we also have women in Tiatira who were mighty men of God, or mighty women of God, who served the Lord with sincerity of heart, and they follow God with divine purpose. So don't misinterpret this teaching in the churches today that the fault is always women. No, there are some women who are better Christian than the men. It plays both ways. It affects both the men as much as it affects the women. But what matter is enduring to the end. If you hold on to your faith to the end, you will be saved. But today, are you ready? That is the question you have to answer for yourself. You saw what Christ demanded of the church of Tiatira. They have labor. They have patience. In fact, they have an impressive record. And this love they had, copy it in your Christian life. If you follow this conduct, you will see Christ. And the writer of the saints will not pass you back. You will see Christ on the last day. Amen. If you follow this conduct of the theater, love, faith, service, persistence, and you follow it to the letter, that your later work is better than what you have in the beginning, mm -hmm. at the end, you will surely see the Lord. But let us pray. Mm -hmm. Now we celebrate the birth of your son. Is there any of you celebrating his sickness? I say receive it, start healing. Is there any of you celebrating a pain? I say receive his start healing. And many of you celebrating a captivity? I say be free. Is any of you celebrating in a fusion? I say be loose. Is any of you celebrating out of pain or not knowing what to do? The Lord will give you hope. And he says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavily laden. I will give you rest. And I say today, lean on me. My yoke is easy. And the body the Lord has handed is light. And he says, if you are tired of labor, come to him today. Come. Let me that is tasty come. Let me that is hungry come. Let him come and buy wine for free. And it does not cost any money. Let him come and drink the water of life without money. And it does not cost any man anything. The Lord is ready to give it for free. Just come. Come, says the Lord. Let him that is hungry come. Let him that is at test come. Oh, come and take up the water of life free. The Lord will give it to you tonight. The Lord will give that water of life to quench your taste. He will give you the bread of life to quench your hunger. Tonight, receive divine grace. As many that come to God with one form of problem or the other in this Christmas, today mark the end of it. What I have, I give unto you. 
I am a son of Abraham. And the blessing of God that abide in Abraham abide in me. My hands are blessed. So anything I touch, I must be blessed. As you stretch your hands to this message, anything you touch will be blessed. <coughs> Anywhere you go will be blessed. Your house will be filled with the blessing of God. Your life will be filled with the blessing of God. Your marriage will be filled with the blessing of God. Your new year will be filled with the blessing of God. From now on, everything that were lost to you, today will produce gain. Every evil will produce blessing. Every anger will produce favor. Receive it in the mighty name of Jesus. God bless you, brethren. If you miss any part of this teaching, you can still watch it on our Facebook page on CGF Open Heart Fellowship, or you can watch it on our website, cgfnslogin.app. God bless you as we end today's teaching. In Jesus' name we pray.